So now we will move to our <laughs> 12th candidate, and it's Meda Rahman. Welcome, Meda. <laughs> Thanks. Adapting brain function to a rapidly changing environment. Mm -hmm. That's your thesis. Uh, Professor Brian McCabe uh, is he's directing. He's right there. He's here. <laughs> really? Yeah, he's sitting right there. Where are you? <laughs> Hi, Brian. Hello. Reminds me of a show, a television show, you know, and we see the family and oh. So, <laughs> welcome, Professor. Uh, so now you have to be ready. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you are. We all know you are. Thanks. So here is your time. You can say start when you're ready. Excellent. Thank mm. you. <coughs> the cells in your brain are called neurons. And in order for you to live your extraordinary lives, these cells need to be active as well as in constant communication with each other. However, most things in life have limits, right? And your brain is no exception to this story. So for instance, if your neurons are communicating, but too much, this could very easily tip the system into a state of chaos, for example, as a seizure. And so the brain actually has some very elegant mechanisms in order to ensure that something like this does not happen. And one such fascinating mechanism is a thing called scaling. Now picture yourselves in this very room with these large windows, but in the summer. In the afternoon, you're probably going to have too much sunlight flood the room, and then you want to roll the blinds down. However, towards the evening, like right now, you have much less sunlight enter into the room, and so then you can afford to roll the blinds up. In both of these scenarios, the goal remains consistent, correct? Which is to keep the room lit, but whilst regulating it to the perfect amount. This is exactly how your brain functions as well, except now your neurons are the blinds. So if the communication in your brain is too much, your neurons can roll down or scale down their sensitivity. But if the communication in your brain is too little, your neurons can scale up their sensitivity. This is a concept that was first described approximately two decades ago, right? And I'm still talking to you about it today because we do not completely understand how scaling works. But this is important because abnormal scaling has been associated with a plethora of clinical conditions, ranging from epilepsy all the way to intellectual disability. But as a fundamental neuroscientist, I would make one argument which is that if you want to use something as a therapeutic target effectively, you have to first invest in fully being able to understand it. And this is what my PhD is about. We in the lab use Drosophila, which are commonly known as the annoying fruit flies in your kitchen, as a model to study scaling. And as odd as it seems, they make incredible models because they have very similar genetics to us, whilst offering the simplicity that researchers require in order to answer complex questions. And so this PhD is aimed at opening doors to two things positively. Firstly, scaling in the context of therapeutics. But secondly, a zoomed-in appreciation for how your brain enables you to live, age, and adapt in a constantly changing globe and environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>